webinar on human trafficking and migration called Assessment of the Perilous Journey in the Mediterranean Sea. Today, we will focus on the analysis of the current situation of the important migratory flow through the Mediterranean Sea, too often forgotten by our media and our politicians. We will try to raise the following questions. What is the plight of the migrants in the Mediterranean Sea? Who is trying to rescue them? What is the risk for them of falling into the nets of human traffickers during their journey from Africa to Europe? What are the legal instruments and customs which protect migrants at sea? I will just mention Article 98 of the 1982 UN Convention on the Law of the Sea entitled Duty to Render Assistance, requiring ships to render assistance to any person at sea in danger, and requiring coastal states to promote the establishment, operation, and maintenance of an adequate and effective search and rescue service on and over the sea and where circumstances so require, by way of mutual regional arrangements, cooperate with neighboring states for this purpose. Allow me to add that the 1974 International Convention for the Safety of Life at Sea, SOLAS, frames search and rescue obligations to states and shipmasters in great detail from the obligation to respond to and coordinate research for boats reported in distress to the obligation to, I quote, assign a place of safety as soon as reasonably practicable. End of quotation. All circumstances are considered, including the obligation for most able to assist a state to cooperate in order to identify a place of safety for disembarkation, the obligation to provide assistance, uh, quote, regardless of the nationality or status of such persons, end of quote, as well as the fact that a status assessment of rescued persons should not unduly delay disembarkation of survivors. And this is a resolution of the International Maritime Organization adopted on the 20th of May 2004. Since the beginning of this year, nearly 2,000 migrants have gone missing in the Mediterranean, according to the International Organization for Migration. According to a press release on, of, on the 10th of June 2022 by the UN Refugee Agency, UNHCR, uh, new data shows a growing number of deaths and tragedies in the Mediterranean Sea. More than 120,000 refugee arrivals and more than 3,000 deaths in 2021. Caroline Abusada, one of the two nice speakers, executive director of SOS Mediterranean Switzerland, has stated that, and I quote, every day on average, seven migrants die at sea. Nearly 25,000 people have died in less than 10 years while trying to reach Europe by sea. SOS Mediterranean Sea, Swiss, based in Geneva, continues to call for major government action, like the UN, it calls for a safer and more orderly migration policy from European states. And the state. More restricted policies on immigration result in more business for human trafficking. And here I'm quoting from her father, Boussy. Uh, however, recent events show us that safer and orderly migration is unfortunately not a priority for government. Just a few days ago, end of October, the ship Ocean Viking, owned by SOS Mediterranean, carried out five rescues for Vincent Winter in the international waters outside of Libya. 2,000 migrants, oh, pardon, 200 migrants were rescued, among which many women and children. Yet, these rescue ships struggle to find a safe harbor where the migrants can disembark and find refuge. Yesterday, Sunday the 6th of November, the Italian government blocked a human ship from disembarking migrants aboard 
only allowing women, children, and those suffering from illness to come ashore. In light of this, migration becomes more dangerous and deadlier on the Mediterranean Sea, while many governments refuse action for a safer and orderly migration. This fuels migrant smuggling and human trafficking in the migration context, as migrants cannot access safe ways to come to Europe. Tonight, we are very fortunate to welcome three distinguished speakers who are experts in the field. First, Dr. Caroline Aboussal, uh, Executive Director of SOS Mediterranean Switzerland, previously Director of the Research Unit of Médecins Sans Frontières, MSF Switzerland. She also works in the field for Oxfam, the United Nations, and MSF Switzerland, where she was Head of Mission in Iraq and Syria. Author of several books and research studies, she taught political science at New York University, Paris, and at Sciences Po Lille. Second, Vincent Cochten, UNHR Special Envoy for the Central Mediterranean Situation as of the 1st of June 2017. He assumed since March 2013 the functions of Director of the Bureau for Europe of UNHR. From September 2015 to uh, January 2017, uh, Vincent Cochten had also assumed the function of UNHR's Regional Refugee Coordinator for the Refugee Crisis in Europe. And third, Father Moussi Zerai, born in Asmara, Eritrea, a Roman Catholic priest known for his work with migrants crossing the Mediterranean Sea from Africa to Europe during the European migrant crisis. He is the head of the refugee rights organization Habesia. Father Moussi was a Nobel of Peace Prize nominee in 2015. If you have any questions, you can write them in the Q&A section. We will discuss them with our speakers at the end of the webinar. You can also find additional documents in the handout section. Feel free to download them. And now, I have the great pleasure to give the floor to our first speaker, Caroline Abusara. Please, Caroline, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Michel, for the introduction and the invitation. I'll, uh, I'll try to, I mean, you, you, if you followed the, uh, the news, you might know that it has been, uh, and it still is a very difficult moment for, for the people on board the Ocean Viking. So I'll, I'll try to walk you through what we do and how we do it and uh, to, to tell you a bit more of what's happening at the, at the moment, um, on board our ship. Um, so just a few words about the SOS. Um, we, we are, uh, actually a maritime and humanitarian organization. Um, so both identities are extremely important to, to us. And um, the associations were founded in uh, 2015, so France and Germany in 2015, Italy 2016, and then Switzerland 2017. And uh, we are uh, operating within a very strict uh, legal framework. The search and rescue operations are, are framed, and I'll come back to, to that uh, later uh, by several conventions, as you mentioned, and it's extremely important for us that this is uh, uh, that we stick to it and that states are actually sticking to uh, to their legal obligations uh, as well. Um, we have chartered two ships uh, so far. So the first one was the Aquarius from February 2016 to December 2018. And now we are chartering the Ocean Viking, which has a Norwegian flag. Uh, and um, we've been operating the Ocean Viking since July 2019. And since uh, two weeks, uh, because the last rescue was performed two weeks ago, we have uh, rescued a total number of uh, 37,023 uh, people uh, since the beginning of our operations. Um, the, the context, so uh, at, uh, you all know there's a very difficult situation in uh, Libya. Uh, with the uh, testimonies of uh, people that probably everyone who has come on board the uh, Ocean Viking has testified about very difficult situations in Libya, family separations, abductions, uh, deten arbitrary detentions, forced labor, torture, rape, 
uh, etc., etc. So we, we it has been um, it has been uh, monitored and it has been uh, uh, shown with uh, several uh, several uh, news uh, outlet as well being uh, having reported on the on the situation plus all the, the testimonies from the people. Um, and the central Mediterranean uh, route is still uh, currently the deadliest uh, migration route uh, at the moment. Also because there's, it's probably the route where we have more data available. Um, but it's, uh, voilà, we, we are talking, the IOM, the International Organization for Migration, is uh, speaking about 25,000 people uh, dead uh, at sea since 2014. So that's in the entire Mediterranean, not only the, the central uh, one. Um, an increase uh, of 41% of the deaths uh, in 2021 compared to the year before, and also an increase of the of the pushback. So it's it's not getting any better, contrary to what people uh, actually think. Uh, the legal framework. Framework. I'm not going to bother you with that, but I think it's extremely important to to just. Remember that it's, uh, as I said, the search, search and rescue operations are, are very well framed. Uh, so we are talking about the uh, duty to assist uh, the humanity, the principle of the rapid disembarkation, and the principle of a safe place. So the, a rescue is considered uh, over when people are disembarked in the nearest uh, safe uh, place uh, possible. So. Uh, from the, so because we will always get the same questions and probably we're going to get them at the end of the discussion, but on uh, but why are you not disembarking people in Libya because it's not a safe place? Why are you not disembarking people in France or in uh, elsewhere because it's not the nearest one, etc., etc. So so we're, we're, that's why I'm, I'm, for me it's extremely important that people know that we actually work according to the law and that the law. Uh, specifies that uh, it's the nearest uh, place of safety to where the the rescue actually happened. Um, we are facing a um, few obstacles, and that's uh, definitely a euphemism. Um, the first the first uh, bunch of uh, of obstacles is definitely the lack of coordination of authorities. Um, during the rescues, uh, so and of course it's different. And for, for the the next two slides, I'm really talking about the situation before the, the arrival of the new uh, Italian government. So, um, so before three weeks ago, there was uh, the Italian authorities were active uh, in in at least they were uh, trying to respond to the to uh, to calls and to to coordinate whenever possible, but they were isolated in, in that uh, uh, prospect. The Maltese authorities do not coordinate rescues, and they do not either provide a place, uh, place of safety when the rescue happened in the South Zone, which is uh, exactly the case at the moment, because of the six rescues uh, we did for the last rotation, three of them happened in the Maltese South Zone. So they should be, according to the law, responsible for providing us, uh, for providing the people on board a safe uh, place uh, of disembarkation. Um, and the Libyan authorities do not respond uh, so far to any of uh, of the communications we've been we've been trying to to have with them. Um, we've also noticed a long, very long delays uh, before disembarkation, and that's that's something that has uh, dramatically increased in the, in the last two years. Uh, so it's, it's something that is, um, uh, very much adding to the distress of the people on board because they have, I mean, not knowing where and when they will be disembarked is extremely uh, distressful for, for people, for the teams as well, by the way. Um, and we never really know how exactly does it work and when uh, are we going to get a place of safety. We also noticed uh, in the last uh, two years that it's either a place of safety or a place of destination that is being provided to us, which definitely doesn't have the same uh, the same meaning. Um, and it's it's clear that it, it is uh, providing an additional uh, burden uh, in terms of uh, 
logistics uh, and and organization uh, of the of the entire operation. On, on top, of course, of what I just mentioned uh, about the the distress and the additional uh, distress that is uh, it's, it's facing on on people. Um, definitely, uh, what we can call uh, an administrative harassment. So there's a uh, uh, state controls are something that are, are normal for for ships. So it's when uh, authorities are going up uh, on a ship and inspecting that everything goes well. So that's perfectly normal. What is not normal is to have so many in so very uh, little time. And definitely, the, 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 it's a bit of a the, the cat and the mouse game where they they inspect and they inspect. So well that they end up with like massive reports on everything that has to be changed from the the paint of the pin to the bulb of the light. Um, so it's and voila, and, and it's delaying the the, the, the fact that we where we can go back at sea. Um, there has also been a recent uh, campaign uh, targeting all humanitarian ships on their, uh, their the certification for passenger limits, which. Which is definitely uh, creating a, an ethical debate because it's it's a bit um, when, for example, on the Ocean Viking, the the the, the limit uh, is 245. Uh, but then, what do you do if you end up with a ship in distress right next to the Ocean Viking? Do you just say, no, no, sorry, we have exceeded our limit. It's eth ethically, morally, and uh, complicated and legally blurry. So it's, uh, we're, we're now facing that, uh, that, and that was uh, before uh, the elections uh, in Italy. Um, and, uh, and it's, uh, there's also just to finish that, and then I'll go on what, what's, what's happening uh, these days. There's also definitely a climate of mistrust um, uh, with with the Libyan uh, Coast Guard. So they're not responding to our calls, uh, not communicating when they hear about an open case or uh, uh, an embarkation in distress. They're not telling us. Uh, they're not coordinating, and uh, and we 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 have uh, noticed few cases where they come uh, near the uh, the Ocean Viking and try to intimidate uh, us. Which is definitely not, uh, you know, creating a, a, a safe uh, environment for for operating. And definitely, last but not least, um, in in few words, um, we uh, went back at sea at. Uh, uh, I think it was the 19th of October. Started uh, rescues uh, two days after. And then heard uh, via media that um, the Ministry of Interior in Italy was considering the possibility to uh, ban us uh, from entering territorial uh, waters, Italian territorial waters. And this uh, was directed uh, directly to two ships. One is the uh, Humanity One, run by the SOS Humanity Organization. The second one was the Ocean Viking, so our our ship, um, and then this has escalated uh, in the last uh, in the last uh, days with uh, two ships, uh, so the SOS Humanity and the MSF ships. Yesterday and before yesterday, were uh, asked to enter were, uh, enter territorial waters because they wanted to get a shelter from the bad weather, and then were asked to disembark only uh, what was uh, like uh, children and uh, and women, and they have so it was children and women for Humanity One, and they left 35 men on board. And then uh, for the Geo Barents, they disembarked 215 people and left the rest uh, on board the ship, which has, of course, created a massive uh, distress within the, the people left uh, on board, uh, safety concerns for the, for the crews, um, and nobody knows uh, what's going to happen. The two ships have been asked to leave the, to leave the port and go back to international waters. 
both ships have uh, denied uh, that and are now uh, entering into a legal battle. But, um, concerning the Ocean uh, Viking, uh, uh, the situation has deteriorated a lot in the last uh, two days. Uh, people are in very bad shape. Uh, there are some are now refusing to get food. Uh, we, of course, now start uh, having uh, people uh, in such a distress that they are considering uh, attempting to their lives. Um, half of the crew is sick, uh, so not able to fully perform their, their duties uh, on board. So it's extremely, uh, it's extremely complicated. Uh, we've called, we've escalated the, the call for uh, support to the French, the Spanish and the Greek authorities to ask them to help us negotiate with Italy uh, for a place of safety. So far, they all have kindly answered that they were not um, neither interested nor willing to uh, to help in the negotiations. Uh, that was the, for the maritime uh, authorities. And we're stranded at sea now for, it's been, so today is the 18th day for some of the survivors uh, on board. So we, we are reaching really a point of uh, where we are, ext we are extremely worried. Uh, to, to, to be really honest uh, with you. Thank you very much, Caroline. Uh, thank you for your intervention. Uh, thank you also for your continuing work for uh, those migrants uh, <laughs> shipwrecked in the Mediterranean Sea uh, and actually uh, definitely will have uh, opportunities to uh, give you the floor uh, to answer questions. And uh, in the handout, so you, you have documents on uh, your action. But now uh, I'm very happy to give the floor to Vincent Cochetel. Uh, and Vincent, uh, I don't know where you're speaking from. Are, are you speaking from Geneva, from Tunis? From Tunis. Uh, good evening oh. to everyone. Very good, very good. So, very happy. So we are on both sides of the Mediterranean Sea. And Vincent also, my cut down to your, your work, your life work on behalf of refugees and uh, looking forward to listen to you. Vincent, you have the floor. Thank you, Michel, and thank you for this invitation to share with co-panelists and your invitees a few observations. I'm trying not to repeat what Caroline has said and uh, I'm, I'm trying to give you a different focus in my presentation on the human trafficking aspect relating to those move, uh, mixed movement, which for some of them end up by sea crossing, but not all of them. Actually, the majority of the people traffic along the way uh, do not end up crossing the Mediterranean. They get stuck on the way. And I think it's important uh, not to forget that dimension of that protection uh, risk that people are facing. So I'll try to link up a bit uh, the two. Uh, so uh, we see the development of route-based smuggling and trafficking scheme. I think it's quite clear that the pandemic has been an accelerator in many ways and that uh, it is quite amazing to see how traffickers adapt the offer uh, to the demand, uh, where we see uh, you know, things like uh, I've never seen before in Sudan where traffickers offer to unaccompany children to recruit eight, nine clients on promising them that for them the trip will be free of charge. Um, uh, others that uh, families that had concern about missing relative underway that have been putting pressure on traffickers uh, to have better safeguards or guarantee about the movement. Uh, so payment is not all up front. Some of the payment is made upon arrival. Um, so that, that scheme is known as uh, go now, pay later. In reality, it's not always the case because you're going to have a lot of coercion and use of violence on the way to try to secure uh, money in the hands of the pockets of traffickers. But we see the adaptation also of that business model on other routes uh, uh, towards North Africa. So that's definitely a concern for us that uh, the response of states is 
very different than for combating terrorism or drug trafficking. There is not the same energy or means going into combating this transnational crime. So when looking at the sea movement, I think Caroline talked about it. Uh, I'll share that presentation. I will not go all over those movements. Uh, I think it's important that, yeah, to know that behind those numbers, you have human beings with very different situation and people moving for different reasons. But nobody leaves his home for, for the fun. It's, it's because they are facing a difficult situation. It could be war. It could be human rights violation. It could be, uh, the socioeconomic impact of the pandemic could be the socioeconomic impact of climate change on some communities and on lack of governance on, on bad development. I think to Caroline presentation, I will only add uh, uh, a few elements. I think, first of all, to keep in mind that when we look at the central Mediterranean Sea, it's important to remind uh, the audience that 15%, 15% of the rescued were operated by NGOs because that there is that criticism going to the NGOs that the NGOs are attracting all the people to leave Libya. No, li people leave Libya because the situation is terrible in Libya and that there is unfortunately very little alternative on safety nets for migrants and refugees in Libya. Um, so 85% of the people are rescued by other actors than NGO actors. So that's to address this issue of uh, pull factor. I think um, one of the some of the practice that, that Caroline has described are, are very worrying as, as humanitarian because they, they question the very fundamental uh, elementary consideration of humanity. We have states questioning that a boat is in distress when we clearly know that the boat is unseaworthy. We have state forcing commercial boats to rescue and force them to bring back people to Libya or to Egypt or to different other locations. Uh, we have the Libyan authorities threatening operators in international waters on which they have no jurisdiction. We have the Libyan authorities invited by the Maltese authorities uh, to proceed with rescue operation, which are actually interception operation in the Maltese uh, SSR. Uh, and when you look at Italy, uh, yes, we share some of the concern that Caroline has said, and we need to find a so solution to the, the current situation, which is not sustainable. But Italy should not be left alone with solution. Italy has welcomed on its territory 88,000 people that have arrived by sea this year. It's not negligible in terms of numbers. And the Italian, the current Italian authorities are still committed to rescue at sea. They have, they have received people, uh, on a regular basis over the last couple of days. Now, when you look at the solidarity effort at the European level to find solution post disembarkation, only 164 people have been relocated to a few other European uh, countries since the beginning of the year. Is that the best Europe can produce in terms of solidarity? 164 person, when we've seen such a massive solidarity uh, uh, for the Ukrainian refugee coming to uh, many European countries. So I think it's important that we uh, uh, look into that and on that, we have a robust, unpredictable uh, rescue at sea capacity in the central Mediterranean Sea because people will continue to leave and uh, commercial actors, ship owners are not necessarily ready to play a front role there. Unfortunately, many are even switching their, uh, their device, their anti-collision device. Um, anytime there is a request for rescue, rescue because they feel that if they rescue, they will not know where they disembark the people. So at the end, more people will die at sea because there is no rescue capacity. So first is rescue, but two has to be uh, collaborative efforts to find solution post disembarkation. And Italy cannot be alone in that exercise. I think I'll leave it here regarding sea movement, uh, but 
Let me also emphasize, uh, and you've covered that in other seminar that you have organized, trafficking does not end with rescue at sea, unfortunately. Trafficking also continues on the European soil, as it does in North Africa and some other countries along those uh, routes. I'll go over some other elements of my presentation. It's uh, just a, a map on sea arrival and disembarkation. I think it's fair to say also that the Tunisian authorities have been disembarking a lot of people, either leaving their shore, either uh, drifting away from Libya since the beginning of the year. So it's not just Italy, it's Italy and Tunisia, uh, uh, you know, uh, doing the most in terms of rescue at sea and disembarkation since the beginning of the year. We've been looking at, uh, with a partner, the Mixed Migration Center, we've been looking at protection incidents, mainly incidents of trafficking along the land routes leading to uh, Libya. And the red circle shows where the trafficking incidents are taking place, where they are mostly recorded. And I think it's important to, to have that picture in mind, because also when we call about a response, we should be where those risks are taking place. And if we cannot be there, we need to make sure that we have national referral mechanisms that are located in the very same place where the people are facing those risks. Uh, I think some of the challenge when it gets to prevention of risk of trafficking on land uh, relates to access uh, to some places and the willingness or the lack of willingness of the authorities uh, to have any actors on any witness uh, at some critical border crossing or some areas. Uh, I could mention a few, but we don't have time for that. But we have definitely dark spot on that map where no humanitarian actor, local or international, have any access. Two, there are safety considerations. There are some places that are clearly out of reach for us or any other partner. And of course, there are logistic and financial capacity problems. Many actors dealing with victims of trafficking may have few resources for training. There is a lot of emphasis on training. This is good, uh, but we should not forget funding basic services. And, and this is uh, badly lacking, lacking in some location. We've conducted recently a mapping of protection services for victims of trafficking in 12 countries leading to Libya. Uh, this report is available here. It was issued in July uh, for the World Day Against Trafficking in Person. This report is available in French and in English. And it's quite interesting for me. The key findings is, well, the services are not located where they should be. You know, everybody is comfortable working in capital city, less so in the key trafficking hubs along the route. So we need to go more local. And that is going to be investing more with local actors and certainly more with local authorities who end up with seeing those people and having very little capacities to make uh, um, adequate referrals to those actors uh, who may be able to uh, provide a comprehensive response to victims of trafficking. The other thing is investing in local access to justice. The tendency that we see along the routes is to say, oh, victims are victims. They need a, a bit of medical and so psychosocial support. Yes, it's important. Uh, but then the, the next step is because people are lacking resources is to say, well, and those people should return to their country. But again, the Palermo Protocol, which has been ratified by most of the countries along those routes, including Libya, foresees that there could be alternative stay and alternative protection measures offered to victims of trafficking. That applies also to European countries. That possibility exists under Article 6 and 7 of the Palermo Protocol. It is used in Italy. It is used in a few countries in Europe. It should be widely used all along the routes. And I think that's something we, we call for. Now, I don't have the time to play that video, but I'll, I'll, I'll share it with you. That's the video that we saw on, uh, on social media, uh, on a platform in East Africa. It's a short video of a Cameroonian, Cameroon, Cameroonian national who is held by traffickers, tortured by traffickers in South Libya. He was supposed to go to Algeria. He was tricked by the trafficker. 
and uh, he gives some information in that in that ransom video, including the name of the traffickers that tricked him in Niger. When we received that video, Salut, chef. Sorry, we, we don't need to, it's two three minutes. Um, I'd like to save them. When we discussed the content of that video with the Cameroonian authorities on the Niger authorities, they had not seen it. It had been seen by two million, two million people on social media, on the anti-trafficking authority in Cameroon, in, uh, in Niger, had not seen it. The Niger authorities moved swiftly to arrest the trafficker in, in Agadez and two of his accomplices and bring them to justice. We've done efforts with various actors in Libya to try uh, to locate this gentleman. A year and a half ago, we still haven't found him. Uh, and he was detained in Libya. And this is the sort of videos or pictures that we receive on a regular basis. Every, every week we receive such videos uh, of people trapped uh, on the way. Uh, again, I don't have time to go over. Sometimes we get tele uh, photographic evidence. We get GPS location of where the people are. But often those people are not even at reach in terms of security. So we have to involve third parties to try to secure that their release in a way that is not harmful to them. And it's very difficult in places like northwestern uh, um, um, Northwestern uh, Sudan. Uh, South Libya, uh, 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 south of Egypt, uh, north of uh, Chad. There are a lot of dark uh, spots, uh, blind spots, where it's very difficult uh, to secure uh, the release of uh, such victims. We've put in place with IOM um, a, a collaborative platform known as PACTAS. It's a platform for of action uh, for aggravated smuggling and trafficking uh, with a focus on Libya, Niger, uh, Chad and Sudan uh, to respond to critical incidents that we receive from families, from NGOs, through social media. We've been able to make, uh, I have to go a bit quickly, uh, but you have the material on that uh, platform in that presentation. We have been able to respond to thousands of cases, not always successfully. Sometimes uh, we forced uh, or we have encouraged the Libyan authorities to take action. So we had a raid of an, a law enforcement authorities on a place where people de were detained in an underground warehouses. Hundreds of people released, but then they are brought to a detention li uh, center in Libya where they are equally at risk of free trafficking. So always the outcome is not totally su successful but we should pursue those efforts uh, to try to secure the release of the people wherever they are. And it should be everybody's concern because, um, you know, it, we're talking here about life or death, and we are talking about rescue on land, which is as much important as rescue at sea. There are more missing people on land than at sea. Uh, I have finished with six bullet points. Recommendation of prevention. We need to step up efforts as foreseen in the Palermo Protocol, Article 9, about information to people about the risk they face on the way, but not just the risk. People are not stupid. People have, everybody has got his own risk mitigation strategy. And, and people believe they're going to be safe on the way. We need to inform people about where are the alternative services they can find in other countries. The road to Libya is dangerous. People die on the way. Any alternative is better. But at the same time, you know, many, at the same time, effort should be made to develop programmatic activities that targets the need of the people, in particular the youth. Often there is nothing for the youth. There are some humanitarian activities for the, for the young, for the elderly. The youth are told that they should fend for themselves. They are not entitled to food assistance, no secondary education, no tertiary education. So unless we have meaningful programming that address their needs, we should not be surprised that people are going to risk their life to embark on those dangerous journeys. Recommendation on the response to victims of trafficking. As I said, invest 
in national referral mechanism with a focus on local actors, uh, a work on alternative solution, not just assisted returns for victim of trafficking, and recognize victim of trafficking as right holders, not just victims. Uh, uh, they can be meaningful witness for successive prosecution if they are safe, if we provide them the safe environment to make their case. Finally, a recommendation to more effective fight against trafficking. Remove the current barrier to information sharing among states. States do not share information. It's quite pitiful the, the poor state of international cooperation in the mat in the manner of trafficking. A couple of good examples of embryonic small pilot project uh, developing here and there, but it remains very, very fragile and very ad hoc. Uh, so we need to pull, to implement that NIAME declaration a couple of years ago that called for much more interstate participation on integration of civil society actors on the response for victim of trafficking. I think we need to use effecting sanction mechanism uh, the UN and the EU have only put on their sanction list very few uh, uh, traffickers. Uh, there are many known traffickers in Libya, in Sudan, in Mali, on those routes converging towards Libya, and yet they are not sanctioned. And I wonder why. Why we don't use those mechanisms? Why not more efforts are made to follow the money? Uh, because the money is not in Libya. Those people put their money in other places, and it's known where. So we call for much more aggressive action by states to go after those traffickers. Then uh, better debriefing of the victims of trafficking when they are safe. This is not happening in many places. Nobody cares about what they have to say. If they don't apply for asylum, their story will never be heard in many, in many instances. And uh, their, their story needs to be heard. And, and as I said, we need to recognize also their rights in that process. Uh, finally, we should encourage states to publish more regular statistics on arrest, prosecution, and sentencing of traffickers. UNODC reports that the, the prosecution rate for human traffickers in Africa has decreased over the last two, three years. And, you know, with that in mind, um, you know, traffickers have bright days ahead of us because the demand is there with crisis deteriorating in West Africa and in East Africa. Some of the movement will continue to converge towards North Africa and some people will continue to risk their life at sea to try uh, to reach safety. So whether again NGOs are there at sea or not, people will continue to move on and, uh, and we need response all along the route and land on that sea. Thank you very much, uh, Vincent, for your uh, intervention and for your impressive maps, but also for your statement about uh, the people trapped in the middle of Africa, in the middle of the desert, and also uh, for uh, your very realistic and pessimistic statement about uh, uh, criminal prosecution. I know that uh, there are two questions on this, uh, and uh, certainly we shall try to answer them. But for the time being, I would like to uh, give the floor uh, to Father Moussi, because Father Moussi also has a few things to say about uh, root causes. Root causes. Uh, it's not enough to, to think or to dream of uh, criminal prosecution. It's also very necessary to address the root causes for those exodus. More restrictive policy in Europe, more business for human trafficking. Accogliere queste persone, integrare queste persone, questo è il modo di dare dignità a questi, a questi morti, ma anche ai sopravvissuti. Mejemeram smetana, mejemeram satana na di nai nai lampirusa. درگشم مونته میتی میتروی تریف نانی رو آتینا آتینا این لانه تصبنی رنا زود هنی هی وقت موزنا و حمود نان لاته تصبنا خلنا و اینا رو ویستو لفیچینارسی دی دو امبارکاسیونی که سی سونا بیچیناتی اونا دلیکوالی ها چرکو نویگاتو این تورنالورو 
e pensavano che eh, eravano ormai, eh, ormai salvi, invece non è stato così. Eh, queste, queste due imbarcazioni hanno visto, poi se ne sono andati senza soccorrere, senza avvisare le, le autorità competenti. Uh, سلزي أنا خمسة مثلاً أفتك زيتي نمرك ما يتمل سلز نبرت بتحت دارك خصاب موتر كله مليونيرو كعقمنا لعلوقينو. nel tentativo di attirare l'attenzione il capitano di questa barcone ha incendiato una maglietta imbevuta di benzina sollevandola sopra quindi sperava con il fuoco di attirare l'attenzione di quelle barche che si, stava, che si stavano allontanando e però cadendo eh, pezzi di quello straccio eh, sul, sulla barca che c'erano gocce di, di benzina e ha incendiato tutto quindi lo spostamento della gente per fuggire dal fuoco ha sbilanciato il barcone che poi si è capovolto e, e da lì è, è andato colato a picco la gente è cominciata a morire, tanti che non sapevano neanche notare, alcuni erano per la prima volta che vedevano il mare. ميتهم كتير يوم فلا خا، كن دي كل عو، كن دي رئيس نورم سبات، كن دي أديتات، بكا كل رئيس هو إنه كتير يوم فلا خا تي زفتر الكاسم عيد. che si faccia prevenzione, prevenzione che queste persone non siano costrette ad affrontare viaggi di questo tipo, che non rischino la vita, prevenzione ai conflitti, prevenzione dalle spogliazioni dei diritti loro, perché queste persone sono disperate al punto di accettare pericoli di questo tipo, quindi bisogna prevenire che queste persone siano gettate in questa disperazione. se non hai le spalle larghe e un appoggio forte per me il mio appoggio e la mia fede e la preghiera il rischio è enorme e il rischio di finire anche in clinica psichiatrica è reale. Mi dato il premio Nobel per la pace, che voi tutti eh, conoscerete probabilmente come l'angelo dei profughi. More restrictive policy in Europe, more business for human trafficking. Da metà maggio in poi, fino a tutta l'estate, fino a quasi metà ottobre, è un continuo di, di telefonate che arrivavano, quindi era difficile, difficile poter dormire, dormire la notte.
Thank you, Father Musi. Please uh, take now the time to comment and to say what you want to say in addition to this meeting. Okay, thank you. Thank you for uh, inviting me. I want to greet our friends Carolina and Vincent. Uh, already, both, both of them, he say very well, all uh, the issue about the Mediterranean, about the trafficking, about all. But the point is first, uh, we, we need to, to deal to to find solution uh, at the root in the origin country. Why these people? Why these people? He put in danger his life. He risk uh, his life in the desert in the Mediterranean Sea. Why these people? He flee from his origin country. Uh, normally, uh, is is not adventure for many of them because, uh, like my people, many of Eritrean especially our young people, he flee from the country because in in the country he don't have any perspective for his future. The only prospect he have is military service for so long time, without end. So if you don't have the freedom to choose for your life, especially the young people, he need alternative solution. That's why many of them he flee from the country because inside the country you don't have freedom. You don't have freedom to speak, no freedom for press, no freedom for religion, because many minority religion is persecuted. Even he don't have freedom to move from place to place. You don't have freedom to choose what can what can uh, what kind of study to do, what kind of job to do. He don't have the freedom. That is, that's why many of them he flee. If we see what is going in Ethiopia, in, especially in the North Ethiopia, in these last two years, still going the war. What is going in Somalia? What is going in South Sudan, in Sudan? So all the Horn Africa is in situation, very complicated situation, in fire, in fame, in a dictatorship. So all this, this is the root of the problem push them to go out. But even when these people is not protected in the transit country, we have a lot of refugees camps uh, around, even in Horn Africa, we, we, for Eritreans, you have refugees camp in Ethiopia, in, in Sudan, in, in Uganda, in Kenya. But what is the condition of this refugees camp? Where is this refugees camp? Most of the time is the very remote area, totally depressed area, without any access for them to the school, to healthcare, to to many other facilities. So, especially the young people, he he can't stay there for so long years. Because I visit myself some of these refugees camp. I talk with the ref with the young people. He say. I, I, I tell you what, what, what he said, Vincent, before we not to, we need to uh, tell them, to explain them the risk of his journey. But when I go there, I tell them about the risk during his journey in the desert, in Libya, all this. The, the question raised by this young people is, yes, we know all this. We have this information, but we need alternative solution. What is the alternative? We need to have access to the school, but we don't have money. So we need to create scholarship for us to study here in Africa, not only to go abroad. To study in Africa, we need scholarship to go to the high school, to technical school, to university. But who take care of us? Who pay the expenses? If we abandon them in the refugees camp with any prospective for the future, these people he tried to flee, to flee to find a way to reach better future in Europe or in other place. So that's why we ask a lot of time to European Union. You need to create protection in the neighbor country, in the transit country. But the refugees camp is not 
the enough protection. Even most of the time, the refugees camp is, is not safety place. What we see in, in some countries like Sudan, when the, the traffickers, he come inside the, inside the refugees camp to kidnap the people, to sell them, to sell them at the border between Libya, Sudan and Egypt. So if even the refugees camp is not safety place, because most of the time the, the security is belongs the, the country who hosts this refugees camp. But if the, some of this military is corrupted, is linked with the ref traffickers, he cooperate with the traffickers, he sell them. So this issue, especially the security issue, is very, very important. We need to create safety place for them, but we need also to create for them dignified life. We need to give them perspective for his future. That means access for education, for health care, for work. That the small experience like in Uganda is positive. In, in Uganda, have the most refugees is allowed them to stay in the city, to stay all, even in the farmer area. Most of them to bring the land to, to, to be farmer. That, that is why to have possibility to have a choice. This is how to protect. The third point is we need to create legal access. We need to create legal access. That means we need to have, as European Union, we need to have a resettlement program. Huge number, not what you, what is going now with the humanitarian corridor. With humanitarian corridor, yes, is good example, but very few, for few cases, very small. We have thousands and thousands of refugees in, in only in the Af sub-Saharan African countries. So we need to have good, big resettlement program organized by European Union to, to give access, especially for those very vulnerable people, for those, for those very persecuted by different case, maybe political, maybe religious, maybe even ethnical. So we have a lot of people persecuted in his country. So we need really international protection. But we need to have this legal access. These are the three points. Then, <laughs> about the meter, what is going in the Mediterranean Sea. The European Union, in this last 20 years, he tried to build a wall different kind of world with the process, Rabat process, with the Khartoum process, with the memorandum with, the, with Libya, is renewed a few days ago. But all this instrument, all this process, all this agreement is not to protect the people, to protect the, those vulnerable people. Only to create obstacles, to build wall. But what is going behind that wall? What is going in the te Libya detention centers? We know, we have the testimony. You see what is the video show by Vincent. We have, I have also many other videos like that. Is what is happening in Libya? What is happening in Sudan? What is happening in Egypt? So these agreements, this uh, process or memorandum is not to protect the people, those vulnerable people is only to create obstacles. That means he, he, he put in danger more, more and more. The traffickers is happy because the traffickers is there to offer alternative, but more dangerous and more expensive. That's why we need the legal access. If we want to fight the traffickers, the only way to, to fight the traffickers is when we are able to offer for re the refugees safety place and legal access. The third point is about the NGOs who go to rescue the people in the Mediterranean Sea. I am involved in the rescue program since 2003. 
Since that time, we asked to the European Union to have a project in the Mediterranean Sea for research and rescue. He don't do. He don't do nothing until 2014 when uh, Italy he put the project the Mare, Mare Nostrum for one year. Then, after he closed that program, we our expectation is that we can have another project that similar like that, but at European level. But he don't do that. Why? This is the duty, the duty of the state to research and rescue the people in danger. The 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 NGOs replace replace the state because the state is is not there, is not there to save the people. Why we have in this last twenty five years we have already more than forty thousand people who die in the Mediterranean Sea. So where is where is the states? Where is the European Union? Why you don't have a project to rescue and to 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 research and rescue program for this for these people? This the NGOs is there now to to save the life from after 2014. That is the point. Why you now to to try to criminalize the NGOs or to 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 create obstacles for the NGOs? Okay, you don't want to have the NGOs, but we need to have european project there to research and rescue the people otherwise that we that means the european union he want to accept thousands and thousands thousands of migrants to continue to die in the mediterranean sea that's not human that is not humanity that is not civilization that is not democracy. So we need to have a program by European Union, or we need to cooperate with the NGO, the civil organization. What he is doing already, his job to save the life of many thousands of people. We need to to say thank you to the NGOs, not to criminalize them. At least this is my short testimony. Then if you have some question, I am here. Yes, thank you very much, Father Musi, for your testimony. And, and, and actually, uh, yes, I would like now to ask both uh, Vincent and Caroline to add, uh, because of course, uh, many times uh, you and each other were mentioned, uh, and uh, Caroline also, of course, you, you, you know what's happening uh, there. Uh, it would be good that uh, before we uh, answer question, uh, Vincent, you take the floor and then uh, Caroline, please. Thank you very much and thank you, Father uh, Moussi. Uh, no, I think you, you pointed to the fact, yes, we need to offer people dignified life where they are. Nobody should be forced to move his country or his country of, or his first country of asylum. And this is true that uh, uh, a lot is missing for the youth, for the category of people who is most likely to move. Because the vast majority of people, they don't move. Huh? They stay in the country of first asylum where they arrive. Those who move are those who have the capacity to move. And, and someone needs to pay for that. I mean, this is also the other side of, of the, of the reality. It's not free of charge, those movements. Um, I would, uh, beg to differ on two points. One is the vast majority of refugees today are not in camps. This is an image for the last 20, 30 years. The vast majority of refugees today in the world, they are living in cities. Uh, those who are in camps are a minority. And yes, sometimes the camp situation are not good, both in terms of protection and assistance, but there are other situations where camps offer uh, a safe environment and an environment where uh, resilience can, can be, uh, can be supported. Um, you criticize the, some of the process, like the Valletta process and the Rabat process. These are state 
processes, uh, not just European. Uh, Rabat, Valle, uh, Rabat and Khartoum process are processes that are issued from the Valletta Plan of Action, which is, in my view, a balanced compact between African Union states and, uh, and European Union states. The problem is the implementation. Too much focus has gone on, on border control. Uh, uh, and not enough focus has gone on, on protection on legal pathways, as you mentioned. But in those dialogues, the, 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 the aspect about protection, be that of migrants or refugees, are there. It's not that it is absent from the text. So those processes per se are not, are not the, the wrong tool. They are not evil tool. They are dialogue tool. And that's for, for, for states and other actors to try to influence those uh, those processes. But you are right. Um, the problem is, you know, when we talk about legal pathways, either for refugees or, or for migrants also, it's it's the egg and chicken discussion with states. State says we will develop them only when we see a, a, a reduction in irregular movement. But then if you look at all available research, there is no correlation between uh, 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 more legal pathways lead to less irregular arrival. This is not true. I mean, we can't lie to people. It's not because you will have legal pathways that you will have less irregular departure. The existence of legal pathways will certainly build a more credible narrative to tell the people, don't take those risks, don't go, there are legal alternatives. It will also facilitate the dialogue with some countries of origin about return, because some some countries of origin cannot care less about their citizens stranded on route or being trafficked on route. They don't want to extend protection to their citizens. And I think there's a real responsibility there about countries of origin. It's fine to held accountable transit countries or countries of destination. We should equally place the responsibility on countries of origin for not keeping their citizens safe, for not uh, respecting human rights, and on sometimes for not readmitting their citizens who are not authorized to reside on the territory of third country. There were a couple of questions in the chat about Morocco. Uh, precisely, we have uh, we have shared all the testimonies of the survivors of that uh, tragedy in Melilla, uh, or the border with Melilla, with the uh, National Human Rights Commission of Morocco. It is also for them to activate existing legal remedies in Morocco. So a full light is being shed on what has happened uh, at, uh, at that border, at that critical border crossing. Uh, I think that's all what I want to say in terms of comments. Caroline, if you want to add, I'm sure you have a Interesting thing to add. Uh, thank you. I mean, not very much to say apart from, um, I mean, building on what Vincent and Father Moussi have, have mentioned about the role of Italy. Clearly, Italy's um, role has been huge in the last years. Um, Father Moussi mentioned the Mare Nostrum uh, operation, which was a state-led operation that uh, rescued uh, over 100,000 people and was stopped uh, under the pressure of the EU under the um, the argument uh, being used was that, uh, as Vincent mentioned, uh, it, it was a pull factor. Um, I mean, there has been numerous studies now that have shown that it's not because you have like two NGO boats uh, in international waters that people are actually taking um, unseaworthy embarkations to, uh, to leave uh, Libya. Um, but still, it's one of those myths that keep uh, popping up from time to time uh, on the topic. And we have asked for European search and rescue uh, mechanism to be put in place. Uh, and I've always said, which actually cost uh, SOS Mediterranean some, uh, some funding, I've always said that the idea with SS was just to be there because there was no state-led uh, operation. But then as soon as a state, a European states, uh, search and rescue operation would be put in place, uh, we would stop because that the idea is not to, uh, to, uh, to do that. It was 
mainly to highlight the fact that there is a need to rescue people uh, at sea. And, and clearly, um, there's also a need to, uh, to discuss uh, uh, safe uh, and predictable mechanism of disembarkation. The, the way we're handling the issue at the moment doesn't work, especially for the for the dignity, the health, the mental health of the people uh, stranded on, on on rescue ships. Um, and there's uh, voilà, there's there's clearly things that have to be done coordinated at a European uh, level and that we can highlight things, we can push, but we need states to actually sit together and, and, and put those uh, two mechanisms at least uh, in place to save lives. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you, Vincent. Uh, actually, uh, I would like to, to add two things. Uh, first, uh, on criminal prosecution. Uh, experts will tell you that indeed criminal prosecution is not working, at least not working yet. And uh, uh, we had uh, um, we had webinars on criminal prosecution, and you can watch uh, video recordings on the 16th, on the 23rd of February, and the 2nd of March 2021. So uh, it, it's part of the solution, but for the time being. A very, a very small part of the solution. Uh, actually, uh, domestic courts could play this, uh, but uh, they don't know how to deal with this. First, they don't know how to uh, <laughs> recognize, identify victims. Second, uh, they think it's too difficult to uh, uh, gather evidence. Uh, and third, uh, uh, of, of course, uh, traffickers are uh, elusive, very difficult to catch and so on. So I think uh, 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 please watch those uh, webinars uh, and then of course I, I completely agree also with uh, Father Moussi in saying we need to address the demand. And the demand also, we, we had also webinars on the demand. Uh, demand as root cause for human trafficking that was for sex trafficking and prostitution, but still <laughs> you have also other kinds of demand, uh, and this demand uh, as root cause for human trafficking that was on the 13th of April and also on the 20th of April. Uh, uh, we had uh, two webinars on uh, uh, those uh, issues. Please watch them. But uh, definitely, <coughs> the demand for <laughs> migration, I think, is a very, very tall order. And uh, as you said, uh, Father Moussi, uh, conflict prevention or solution, then uh, mitigating climate change, then definitely, uh, <laughs> what about uh, uh, um, uh, not necessarily development aid, but uh, uh, clearly also uh, helping governments to, uh, to maintain the rule of law, because uh, obviously, if you have no rule of law, then traffickers uh, uh, or migrant smugglers have uh, have uh, the easy way uh, and no obstacle. Uh, but uh, I think cooperation is very much needed, and cooperation not only between uh, European states, but also between European and African states. And I think, thank you, Vincent, for mentioning the Valletta. Uh, agreement, because the Valletta Agreement, as you say, was a kind of a, a, a balance to try to find who could be right on both sides of the sea. And uh, 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 let me see, uh, I hope uh, this exercise should be repeated. And, and Vincent, I don't have to tell you that uh, actually on the 8th and 9th of, of uh, December, this year, uh, uh, we'll have this uh, 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 High Commissioner's Dialogue on Protection, and uh, uh, next year there will be also uh, another uh, dialogue on protection, uh, taking stock of uh, the Global Compact uh, on Refugees. But obviously, uh, the the first remark is to say, okay, we don't have to wait until then. We, we definitely have to find solutions. And, and I think that uh, indeed NGOs, indeed uh, 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 journalists, 
indeed uh, spiritual leaders and, and, uh, and priests like you, Father Musi, but uh, I know that uh, spiritual leaders, uh, for the, on, the, on the 2nd of December 2014, in Rome, addressed uh, an appeal and said, we spiritual leaders, uh, Christian, Muslims, Hindu, Buddhist, Jews, uh, we commit ourselves, ourselves to uh, work for uh, the uh, elimination, uh, the abolition of modern slavery. Obviously, uh, we are very far from this. But still, uh, we must have a very broad, a very broad coalition. Uh, we must build public conscience. And I think what, what, we, what you are doing, Caroline, what you are doing, Father Moussi, and what you are doing by so, so are, are very important to show people, including these two Cameroonian uh, fellows, uh, to show people crying for help and say, look, I don't have to eat, I don't I have water, I cannot wash myself, I don't have any prospect for freedom. And look, this is really modern slavery, and we, we need really to uh, uh, to say so let me see the name. Uh, we need really to uh, uh, to answer uh, this. Uh, and uh, then my last word is a cooperation. I would say cooperation, let me see, uh, is not necessarily going the good way. I know that. Uh, so Frank, I think cooperation is usually going uh, well when you have a financial or economic interest uh, to share. Uh, but then precisely that up to us uh, to raise public conscience and to say there are not only economic interests, but there are also uh, uh, humanity at stake. Uh, and that's what we are witnessing now uh, with uh, this situation of migration from Africa to Europe, uh, uh, in the Sahara and in the Mediterranean Sea. Okay, so who would like to add something? Father Moussi? Uh, just only to add something about the, the refugees uh, camp or the urban refugees. Yes, we have a lot of urban refugees, but also uh, Vincent, he know very well what is going, for example, in Sudan. Uh, most of the time, the police, he arrests them, he, to, he treats them badly, and uh, he asks them also to pay. I denounced this a uh, few weeks ago with uh, UNHCR in uh, Khartoum. Uh, the police, he, daily he go to find uh, refugees, especially the uh, Eritrean refugees, he arrests them, he tells them, if you want to go uh, to release, you need to pay five hundred dollar. This it become a, like a business. We have the same cases situation in Kenya, even in Ethiopia. We have problem because that is related also with the ethnical problem because it is a conflict there with Tigray. So he put he arrest them in the city, the urban refugees in Addis Ababa to bring them to obligate them to go back to the refugees camp. So. It is not easy to to say uh, now our refugees is free to stay in the city, but not in all the countries is the same condition. Just to say to add this, thank you. You know, thank you very much, Father Musi. There was a question from Sister Franca to Caroline. Uh, when you are rescuing people at sea, do you get the data where the migrant originated from? And what do you do with this info? Um, I, I just saw that. Um, so we, you, you might know that now we have a partnership with the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies. Um, so they, um, they have put in place uh, what we call a Salamat uh, process. And the idea is to be able to inform uh, families of uh, people on board that the, their, their loved ones are safe. Um, so we do have uh, the, 
the nationalities of the people we were rescue, we we don't do anything with with that information. Like it's not. Uh, I mean, we 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 share whenever necessary, um, but but it's but well, it's not. We're we're not communicating information on uh, on the people uh, and the identities of uh, of people on board. And I saw that if I may continue, there was also another question on the selective landing policy. Um, I, I, I understand the need of the, the Italian uh, government to make a point and push uh, for other states to actually support uh, the process and share the burden. However, I, first, I don't think that should be done um, while taking uh, people who are already in a, in a very, very distressful situation uh, as hostages. I, I don't think it's the proper way to handle that. And second, it's not it's not legal uh, to disembark some and not others, or to disembark half of the ship and not the other half. Um, that it's not the law. The law uh, says that we have to disembark uh, every uh, rescued people in the nearest place of safety from the place where the rescue took place. So it's uh, voilà, and you know, we we actually stick to the legal uh, framework, and would like everyone to actually stick to the to the legal framework. Thank you, Caroline. For you. A very good answer, so, so uh, Vincent, you have a, a last word? I just wanted to say that, uh, you know, it's also the, as I said, we, people move from, from various reasons, and it's important to identify better who are victims of trafficking. Uh, mm -hmm. Just for your audience to know that about 35% of the people arriving in Italy uh, will get some form of protection in Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, The others uh, will live in irregular situation, uh, will be requested to, to leave um, the country where they are, which they may do for some, but for the majority uh, lies ahead of them a miserable life. They, they will not get a uh, residence permit in Europe. And I think that's, that's another, let's say, social and human social time bomb uh, that exists and that we are not uh, necessarily tackling well in Europe. They are not easy solution. Uh, big debates in countries whether whether you should regularize, whether regularization or partial regularization lead to pull factor. There are difficult debates uh, on no simple response by states. Uh, but just wanted to clarify uh, that information in terms of uh, what's likely to arrive to people who, uh, who get on those boats who go to Italy. Thank you very much, uh, Vincent. Father Boussi, please. Just to say, yes, uh, Vincent, he say uh, this issue about many of them who, who come uh, from, especially from African sub-Saharan countries, Not all of them he flee from war or something, but the the point is yes someone someone even he he flee from the country for economy reason, but during his journey this these people he become victim victim of trafficking, victim of violence, victim of abuse, so his condition from his origin from his departure is totally changed. So the point is, when he arrived in Europe, most the the, the uh, asylum uh, system is based. If you are, if you come from this country, you have the right to be recognized refugee. But you don't recognize it, all the story of this person during his journey. His to his condition is totally changed. He is already his victim, victim of different. Victim in the prison of Libya, victim in in the desert, victim. So the, he need to recognize all the story of this person. You need to to give protection, not 
because you are belong that country because in that country is war or in that country is some uh, dictator so you you don't have the right or you don't have the freedom yes you recognize you but even if i am from cameroon or from uh, i don't know from ghana I, I I flee from my country for economic reason, but during his during my 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 journey in the in the desert, in the, I become a victim of torture, of violence, of abuse. I, my condition is totally different. So we need we need to recognize this this situation, this story of these people. That's why we need to protect them. When he arrive in Europe, we need to give them. Maybe yes, you are not political refuge, but you have, you have, you need a protection because you are victim of this all violence. Thank you, Father Musi, and uh, I think uh, I should now close this webinar and thank really from the bottom of my heart all speakers uh, and participants. Because we had a very intense webinar, uh, thanks to our outstanding speakers, I would like to wish them the best, not only personally, but for the good work they are doing, and uh, for this uh, <laughs> I say, uphill battle they are fighting uh, uh, to try to save those uh, migrants in danger. Thanks also to our listeners. For the interesting questions we see tonight. Uh, my special gratitude goes to Yves Reichenbach, our webmaster, and my assistants in Geneva, Clara Breger Isepi, and Emanuele Piluso. I would like to invite you to our upcoming webinars, Tuesday, the 29th of November at 6 p.m., on forced labor and transparency of supply chains towards prescriptive or legally mandatory approaches. Then on the 6th of uh, uh, December at 6 p.m. on faith and human trafficking, testimonies of sisters working in the rehabilitation of victims. And we shall have two sisters from Africa, one from Nigeria, one uh, from uh, uh, Ghana, uh, and one also uh, from Germany, having worked in Albania. And uh, the video recording of this webinar shall be available in a few days on our website at laudatosi.org with subtitles in English, French, German, Italian, Russian, Spanish, and Chinese. Feel free to share the link. Our own English online course on human trafficking for helpers is now translated and available in French and English on the CUHD website. It will soon be available also in Italian and German. And I wish you all the best. I invite you to our upcoming webinars on the 29th of November and the 6th of December. Thanks to all and best wishes, especially to our three speakers, uh, Father Moussi, Caroline, and Vincent. Merci d'être avec nous tous trois. Et bravo. Et tous mes voeux pour tous. Le travail magnifique que vous faites. Thank you.